Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with saxophonist and composer Patrick Zimmerly. He talked about his newest 2018 CD, Clockworks, and so much more. This New York and Paris-based musician writes a sophisticated and approachable hybrid of contemporary classical and jazz music. He has written numerous orchestral, chamber, and choral works, and in 2015, he was awarded the Chamber Music America New Jazz Works Grant supported by the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation. His journey in music has been a long and rich one. His music has been featured on MoMA's Summer Garden Series, the Guggenheim Museum, on NPR, and the Jazz Composers Collective. So please get to know him and dig this interview, my friends. Patrick, thank you for taking a minute out for Neon Jazz. I appreciate it. Oh, no, no problem. Glad we could connect. Absolutely. So let's go ahead and talk about your latest CD, Clockwork. Give me an idea... Of, of kind of the creative forces that went into this project and how you feel about it. That project was actually a, a grant that uh, it, it came out from a from a grant from the Chamber Music uh, Chamber Music America. They have these new works jazz jazz grants. I won one in 2015 to write a piece for uh, an old quartet of mine. So maybe I guess I have to give a little background about myself. I'm a composer. I started out as a tenor player and was active in the 90s in New York. And I played a lot with people like Ethan Iverson and John Hollenbeck, a million other people. But uh, I, in particular, had a band with these guys, Ethan and John, and uh, uh, Reed Anderson was the bass player, actually. So this was before the Bad Plus. And, uh, and we did a record called uh, 12 Sacred Dances on Arabesque, which was a, a, a jazz label that, was, uh, that did a lot of stuff at the time and did quite a few performances with this music, which was very complicated and difficult. A lot of very crazy polyrhythms, and it was a lot, very influenced by modern, like, 20th, 20th century classical music, but, like, um, Elliot Carter and Milton Babbitt and people like those guys. So I wrote a lot of music like that, and we worked really hard on it because it was really tough at the time. And then, uh, you know, my, my career took a bunch of twists and turns. I started writing for a lot of classical ensembles, and I kind of lightened up on the rhythmic complexity. I, I did that because uh, I noticed that our message, the musical message, wasn't totally getting across to an, the audience in the way that I wanted because the music was so heady that it would just go over people's heads. Even musicians, I found, wouldn't really understand, couldn't really understand what we were doing. So I was like, well, maybe, I'm, maybe I need to like, tone it down a bit and keep the kind of same musical message but use simpler means to communicate it. So I started writing for chamber music and orchestras and had a lot of success in that world. And then I started collaborating with, with, uh, with some uh, friends from my jazz youth like Brad Meldow and um, Kevin Hayes. We did a project in 2011 called Modern Music. And then uh, I did this thing with, with Josh Redman. So I was doing stuff that was a little bit, a little bit like more, more easy to, to hear, very melodically oriented. Still with some rhythmic stuff, cool stuff in there, but... Um, things that, that would read more to, to the listener. This was great, and I, everything was going along well, but there were just a few people who really, really wished that I had hearkened back to my older style with the more complicated stuff and really wished that I hadn't abandoned it. And one of them was Ethan. Ethan always, uh, you know, really loved that period of my music, and he wanted me to, to sort of get back there. So when I got this grant, it was like the idea was we were going to, like, go back and explore some of those complicated, more, more complex rhythmic ideas, a context that's a little bit easier easier to, to comprehend than, than from, from those days. So that was like the genesis of Clockworks. How's that for a long answer? I like it. I, you went all <laughs> over the place, too. So you hit a lot, of, a lot of pieces of where I was going. So to kind of pick apart what you said, where did everything start for you? Talk about your childhood and how you got involved with jazz. Okay, yeah, I think we, I think we have to reach back. Well, my brother, my older brother is a classical pianist, so I loved music from uh, a young age. He was, he was a prodigy. He was doing, like, concerts when he was age seven, playing Beethoven and, and Bach and stuff. And so I was very uh, impressed by that. <laughs> but I wasn't allowed near the piano. That was his territory. So I had to sort of go towards the woodwinds. And indeed, like, it was discovered that I had an, uh, an affinity for improvisation. So I started playing jazz. And I got really into it in high school. I was uh, really shedding Train and Joe Henderson. Joe Henderson, one of my biggest influences, and to this day, I, I'm really, I really, Joe is, is really one of the people who, who really grabs me the most. 
and all, of course, the Sunny, uh, Bird, you know, everyone. I just got really immersed into it as a high school student, and I was at West, in West Hartford, Connecticut, where they had a really important uh, high school jazz band at the time, and we would tour Europe like every three years. In fact, my relationship with Brad dates to that time. He was two years below me, and he was like uh, just this little kid playing Grateful Dead tunes on the piano, you know, so our, everyone's eyes were, we were all like, man, go check out some monk, you know, or whatever. Uh, <laughs> and I guess he did. <laughs> he went on to do, do so. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I was really, really into jazz when I was like uh, a teenager. I was uh, performing professionally in the Hartford area with guys like um, Nat Reeves and Steve Davis, who were, um, of course, uh, still amazing players to this day. And so I was getting a lot of, a lot of experience in that world. I didn't really want to go to school. Um, and this was the, this was just when jazz schools were starting. So I didn't want to go to college for jazz. It didn't feel like the right thing to do. But the new school was just starting that, the year that I went to college. But I, I didn't want to go to school at all. But my parents were like, well, look, you've got the grades. You might as well. So I, I went to Columbia in New York where, uh, where I could be in New York and be, a, be amongst musicians, but still sort of like be in college. You know what I mean? So, uh, that was great. I, uh, I, I played around, played around town for a bit, but I got increasingly interested in, in writing. And so my, my Columbia experience really, like, uh, got me immersed in the classical composition thing from Bartok to Schoenberg to, uh, to pretty much all, you know, all, all, all classical music. And that's when I start, started to uh, mix those kinds of influences into my writing, and I started to have bands and, uh, and started playing with people. So that's sort of how, how I got my start. You know, the thing about you is that there's, there's a level, of, there's a hybrid level of jazz and classical. And... How much do you play to both of those, or is it so woven into who you are, it's just what comes out? You know, I think it actually really varies from project to project, and it varies from moment to moment. Right now, like, I'm writing, a, again, I went through a phase where I was just working with jazz musicians, and it's and now I'm kind of veering back, doing some commissions for classical ensembles again. It's definitely what, what comes out, like, melodically and rhythmically is just kind of part of who you are. For sure. I mean, I don't really consciously say, oh, I want this to have a more of a jazz vibe or a more classical vibe. I would say what separates me from a lot of other jazz composers that I hear is just like a lot of resources, you know, like textural resources, like thinking, um, thinking more imaginatively about orchestration, not, not depending so much on solos. You know, a, lot of, a lot of jazz composers that I know, even very, very reputed ones, will come up with maybe like a head or kind of a, uh, a thing that's maybe interesting. But then there's, there's like a ton of blowing. And for me, I, I am okay with improvisation, <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, it's, it's, to me, it's, it's best if it's in, in a context, you know, and like in, if it's like folded into a, a journey that's already happening and then it just like adds to that journey rather than sort of interrupting or sort of just, just being, being, the, being the entirety of what's going on. So for me, there's like, I guess, an overall, in, a, a way of integrating improvisation into an overall compositional thing that, like, I would just, compositional is like a big word. I would say it's like trying to make a musical journey that, like, an audience can relate to and, particip and participate in and having blowing be a part of that rather than be having blowing be the focus, you know. So speaking of journey, you, you travel pretty well between Paris and New York, and you've been in so many spots in between. How important is it for you to see other parts of the world and give your music to them? <laughs> well, uh, you know, travel is broadening. <laughs> it's true. They say that, you know, and it's true. Um, it's, it, it definitely opens your mind to other things. Uh, but I've been traveling for, I've been traveling for a lot of my life. In fact, my dad worked for the airlines, for American Airlines, back before it, 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 it uh, its reputation sank. <laughs> which was which was like thirty years ago, but uh, but but so I've I've I'm used to traveling. I think traveling is great. The one thing is that's cool about though being a composer is you don't necessarily have to travel for your music to travel. And so my music actually has gone more places than I have. I have had premieres in Korea and you know in in Asia and diff all kinds of different places that I actually haven't been. So that's that's one of the great things about being composers. You can be sitting back, you know, you can be kicking back and somewhere around the world your your music's being played. I like that. Without a doubt. You know, I'm reading Nate Shannon's book about what's going on in jazz today and he, he has this section where he talks about Joshua and Brad and talks about them being young lions and I would definitely put you in that classification of, of cats that are really pushing the envelope, that are really just 
out there doing things that Jazz needs to have done. So my question is this. In 2018, how is Jazz doing as far as you're concerned? <laughs> I'm, I'm going to say, first of all, that, like, I don't know, do not know. I, if this were a multiple choice, I would check off the box, Mark, do not know. And the reason I say that is it's, it's really, it's a very vast thing. Jazz is a very vast and amorphous term, you know. It covers a lot of different music. It covers a lot of different people who are doing a lot of different things. And I do not pretend, I mean, I'm very focused on what I'm doing, so I don't pretend to know, like, what the, what everyone else is doing, you know. So that's, the, that's like my, 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 my lasting comment uh, about, about that. And, and anything else I should, I might say should be taken in the context of, like, I don't know. I don't know. But I have heard uh, a, a lot of good music. I mean, I, I would say, you know, there are, there's a lot of good music being, being played out there, man. I mean, I, you know, it's, it's like you can, you, can, you can definitely make the case that um, the music has kind of lost a connection to its dance roots, um, that, that people are going a little bit heady and, uh, and, and sort of like, um, it's kind of like, uh, th there's, there's a your virtuosity at the expense of kind of, um, audience experience. You can go the, you can go that, you can go the, well, jazz education has ruined everything route, you know, uh, uh, I, I don't know. I, I really, but, I, but like I said, man, there's, there's like so many great musicians up and coming, great players, people who have really interesting ideas, and I don't know all of them, and and it seems like jazz is everywhere, and uh, there's 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 a lot happening, you know, uh, worldwide. So so I mean, I guess in that sense, jazz is doing great. You know, it's just it's certainly different from you know the 1930s. <laughs> yeah, but a lot of this, but everything's different from the 1930s. You know what I mean? So it's like yeah. I, I resist starting to go off. You know, I'm just sure. I'm just focused on on my own thing and trying to. I'm here and I'm trying to do the best I can to to, to write some interesting music uh, that people will, will enjoy listening to. So this is something I'm sure you will know, and I want to ask you this: as a professional musician that gets to create every day is your job, what do you look forward to the most? when you face the day. You wake up and you look down the road of what you're going to do. What's the coolest thing that you get to do? <laughs> I do have the luxury that I've, I've cho chosen my life. So, uh, I, in a sense, everything I do is, um, is I, I enjoy and look forward to. Uh, I start off the day always by writing. And so that's, that's, a really great, um, that's a really great thing where I get to sort of work out my ideas in a kind of very calm and focused way. That's a really cool way to start things off. But then, you know, there's a lot of a lot of what I do involves all kinds of stuff from, you know, like uh, meeting people and talking to people, trying to get projects going, you know, see, seeing where I can make work uh, in the in the way that that I do things, which is a little different than most jazz musicians. So those things I've learned to. So it's it's sort of like the business side, you know, and I've been learned to enjoy that just as much. I mean, it's it, business is just like sort of about interacting with people, making things happen that wouldn't otherwise happen, getting people to, to sort of unite in a, in a common purpose, and that's that's a great feeling also. So I really enjoy. Uh, pretty much every, uh, I mean, everything I do has challenges, including the writing. Sometimes it's like, ah, uh, it's not working, or I can't get this section to go right, you know. Um, everything has its challenges, but everything about what I do is, is pretty rewarding, so I'm, 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 I'm pretty excited about, about all aspects of what I do. You know, throughout your career, you've been pretty fluid, pretty active overall with what, what you do and how you do what you do. My question is this, are you happy with how things have turned out up to this point in your life? <laughs> you mean life satisfaction? Well, yeah. Are you happy with your career? Are there things in your career that you're happy with, what the direction is, what could what can be accomplished down the road? Just kind of overall satisfaction. Writing music and having people listening to it is a, is a priority for me, and, and so uh, I want to do that in the largest way possible. I think I'm, a, I'm very ambitious, and for people who are ambitious, what, what was the thing when they, they asked um, J.P. Morgan, well, how much money is is enough and he was just like just a little bit more you know hmm. i mean the 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 thing about that is that he that kept him getting up in the morning of course for me it's not money that's i hope it's not money that's making me get up in the morning but uh you know i mean i've been able to accomplish certain things um and I, that i'm proud of but i definitely 
want to keep going and having things done in a bigger way. I still think that I've got a lot of a lot of things in front of me, and I'm definitely not done. I mean, certainly, I sh- I'd love to be writing for really big orchestras and you know having my band tour uh, in, and played played to sold out crowds in, in big venues. Um, so so those are those are ambitions that are uh, that are keeping me going. But um, but at the same time, I've done a lot of things that I'm I'm proud of, and and so I'm so I'm satisfied with that. You know, in your career, growth is going to be measured by what you've done, you know, the education that you got. And the other thing is the live shows that you've seen that definitely will move you. What live jazz shows have you seen that really made the impact on you? That's a good question. And I'm sure, and that's a good, great question to ask anyone because I'm sure they'll come up with some, some great things. I, I was just thinking, I've been thinking a lot about Joe Henderson actually because I, uh, I introduced, I was introducing a friend to, to jazz, uh, who didn't really know that much about him, about jazz, and I was actually hip, hipping him to some, uh, obscure West Coast players in the 50s, like Bob Cooper and stuff. But in fact, but then I was like, wait, this guy really needs to know the basics, and I threw him some train, and, and then I, and, I, and then I, and then we put on a Inner Urge. Man, that's a great record. Really, people should go back and check that out. It's like, it's really visionary. Anyway, uh, I remember that that brought to mind uh, seeing Joe at the Vanguard in the early '90s with his trio, and man, it was just like it was so great. And I remember that just really setting a setting a massive standard for me to to make my music be the best it could be. I was just, I was so floored by Joe at that point. Yeah, that was a great show. But I mean, that's just that's just like one one example. I've seen a lot of really incredible concerts in my life for sure. Yeah. Well, I love that trajectory of th- there's such a joy in giving people that gift of music. And I was thinking my son's 13, and he has a friend. His dad just told me the other day he's getting into vinyl. And I'm going to surprise him at the bus stop this week, and i got a stack of vinyl from Cab Calloway to Count Basie, uh, you know, Benny Goodman, Amazing. Carnegie. Yeah, you know, and I, I think it's stuff that he probably hasn't heard. But when you can give youth that, it's kind of like those old cigarette ads. They wanted to hook you. So you smoke the rest of your life. <laughs> kind of like that. Yeah. Kind of like that healthy addiction. Like get them started, get their feet shuffling, and let them move through their life. You know. And, yeah, absolutely. Uh, wow, that's a great that's a great gift. Yeah, and this, I'm I'm into this vinyl resurgence too. That's a lot of fun. Yeah. Oh man, it's, it's it's beautiful. And for a kid that's 13, getting into it, like his dad told me, he got Billy Joel the other day, and it's like, well, if he liked that, he's got to enjoy Benny Goodman at Carnegie. There's just no way around that. So, <laughs> amazing, so amazing. We'll keep we'll keep our fingers crossed on that one. But let me <laughs> ask you this generically: Why do you love jazz? Uh, well, like, yeah, I mean, it is historically the highest American means of expression. You could say. I mean, you know, it's it's. Uh, I mean, the American society as, it, as it's grown, jazz has kind of come along with it. So, as someone who's grown up in that in this country as well, you know, I think it stands for, stands for who we are in a really deep way. There's this flexibility about it. There's a spontaneity about it. There's a group, there's a sense of teamwork about it and group interplay and listening to other people. And to me, it's metaphorical for what can be great about society. You know, people from different backgrounds can come together and play it. It's, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's really this amazing music that, that uh, is, is a kind of metaphor from the, for the American experience and I think continues to be. Absolutely. So let me get to the heart of you. Everyone has a perception of who you are, your family, your friends, your fans, colleagues, but you know yourself best. Who do you think you are? <laughs> well, that depends on what day it is and, in fact, what time it is. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so okay. now, so... So, uh, I mean, like, you know, a couple hours ago, I was just hungry for lunch, you know. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I mean, I think that, yeah, I'm someone who's had a lot of opportunity within America, and I've chosen to sort of uh, pursue, pursue this artistic path for a reason. I think I have a perspective on, on existence, uh, contemporary existence, that's worth, and hopefully uh, I'd like to be an inspiration to people who are around me in all ways. So that's... That's why I guess I strive to be. And, and I, I guess I would say that I'm also someone with a very uh, intellectual attitude, very intellectually interested, very curious, and uh, always hungry to learn more and to, to be, be the best version of myself I can be. Beautiful. I think that's a great way to wrap everything up. Patrick, thank you for taking time out for Neon Jazz, and certainly thank you for the music that you give the world. We appreciate it. Oh, man, it's a pleasure. Thanks for listening and tuning in to yet another Neon Jazz interview. 
where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in Paris, New York, Kansas City, and spots all over the world giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Patrick for his music and his cool. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com. And for everything Neon Jazz, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.